Okay, stats class, here's lesson 14.1b, which is about multiple regression, of course, and this time about inference for multiple regression. And I have some really good news for you. The first piece of good news I have is the conditions we already know. I'm going to write them down, and you should too, but they are exactly the same as in chapter 12. When we did linear regression, single linear regression, I guess it would be called, um, it's the same. So let's just review what those are, and then we'll talk about the rest of the four steps after that. So same as in linear regression. Random. Yes, we're going to check to see if we have a random sample. I'm not going to say any more about that, because it should be like, of course, we need it random. Normal. So just like in Chapter 12, we are going to graph the residuals and see if they look normal. And most of the time, the book is going to give you the graphs and say, look at these graphs and comment on what you see in them. So that might be a histogram that they give you, or it might be a box plot or a dot plot. Or it might be a normal probability plot that has to look approximately linear. That's pretty common. Uh, but you're not going to usually make the plots. You're going to just look at the plots and say, oh, that looks pretty normal to me, and then you move on. Independent, same as always, it's the 10% rule unless it's an experiment, and then it's just because of the treatment. I'm not going to talk about that. You already know how to do it. And then remember in Chapter 12 we had two more? Oh gosh, there was two more. There was one that said linear, and there was one that said equal variances. I saw that one in again with ANOVA. So linear, we're going to check the scatter plot. And remember that there's two lines on the plot. I'll go get those next to just flash at you real quick. Yeah, there's two lines, and they both have to be not curved. That's nice. You could just look at the original scatter plot and see if each group looks linear. Or you could look at a residual plot and see if they, uh, there's no pattern in the residual plot. not curved. There is something different about residual plots in this um, when you're dealing with um, multiple regression, and I'll mention it right here, that we still have zero here and above and below zero, right? But usually you can't really put x on the x-axis because you've got two different x's, so like which one would you put? What they usually do is they put y hat there. They put the predicted y values on the x-axis and then the residuals on the y-axis and what you're looking for is exactly the same as what you'd be looking for before. In fact, if you do single linear regression like we've done before, and you put do a residual plot with x's and then do another residual plot with y hats, you'll get the same exact pattern in the residuals. And so with multiple regression, they just always put the predicted value there. So that they don't have to decide which x value to do and how do you plot two different x values. You just don't have to worry about it. Just put y hat. Um, and then equal variance, by the way, they're going to give you this graph also. You don't have to worry about it. Um, equal variance, you look at the residuals again. Oh, residuals, and they have to be evenly scattered and not um, thinned. Being spread all the way along, um, like icing on a cake and not like the icing at one end and thin at the other. So that's the first good news is you already know how to check the conditions. The second good news I have for you is I don't know how to do this on the calculator. Multiple regression, there's no shortcut for it on the calculator. There's just, I don't know how. So you are always going to use computer output. So the computer output will give you what you need for these. The graphs will be given to you as part of the computer output. And the numbers you need also will be given to you as part of the computer output because um, we're not going to learn how to program the, the computer statistics software. We're just not going to do that. So they're going to give you, on every problem in your homework and on the quiz, they're going to give you computer output. And that's fine. We're just going to learn how to interpret it because that's what the human brain is good at. All right, so there are two types of inference, and yes, we are doing them both in one day because they're really not very hard. 
sequences inference that can be done with multiple regression. And I'm going to do them as two columns because actually the first column needs to be narrower than the second. Let's do about a third of the page here and two thirds of the page here because there's a little bit more to write on this side. But I'm going to do them together because they both have the same conditions. And I'm just going to, when I get to conditions, I'm going to say see above. So we're going to learn two types. And they're both important. So we have the overall F test. Yes, we're using F again, like we did with ANOVA. So that kind of reminds you of ANOVA, I hope. And then we're also going to do what's called individual T test. But don't worry, because the computer output is going to give you all that you need for all of that. And the hardest part is you have to be able to um, write the hypotheses and interpret the results. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So the state step. Let's talk about hypotheses. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you the overall F-test is for the whole model, the whole model that has multiple explanatory variables in it. We want to know, is this whole model useful or not? And then we also can test individual parameters within that model. For each individual parameter, we can test to see if that parameter is important or significant or useful. So that's where we're going with this. For each individual parameter, we can do a test. We actually already know how to test the slope parameter specifically. So that we're just going to combine that with what we're doing with the other ones. So the null hypothesis for the overall F test is kind of fun uh, because it kind of reminds me of a couple other chapters where we just had a whole bunch of things and we want to see if they're all equal to each other or not. We have, remember we are using, remind you of yesterday's notes again, uh, B1, B2, and B, B0, B1, and B2 are being used to estimate beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2. If the model is not useful, then these might as well all just be 0. So we're checking to see, actually not um, the not the y-intercept one. This one starts with b beta 1 equals beta 2 equals however many others we have, except that for now we're just going to have two of them, and they would both equal 0. So beta 1 equals beta 2 equals 0 is basically saying that I don't need x1 to help me predict y, and I don't need x2 to help me predict y. All I need is the y-intercept. That's what my null hypothesis is saying, that all we need is the y-intercept, and that is a perfectly good predictor, which is usually not true, by the way. Usually our model is useful, and, we, and there's more going on there than just the flat line average. But this is saying that the y-intercept is just as good a predictor all by itself. And then alternate is at least one of them is not zero. At least one of those um, parameters is useful to make predictions. For the individual t-tests, you write hypotheses for each parameter separately. So there's going to be at least three sets of hypotheses, but they're all easy. So null, you're going to have one for the y-intercept, if the y-intercept is important because maybe the y-intercept is zero and maybe we don't need the y-intercept, right? So that's this one is the y-intercept. Beta zero appears here but not there, so be careful about that. The alternate is that it's not equal to zero. I suppose we could do a greater than or a less than, but the computer output assumes not equal, so we're going to stick with that. And then you have a separate set of hypotheses for beta one which remember beta 1 is the slope. We already have done this before. This is the slope. Except before we called it beta, and now we're calling it beta 1. It's okay. Third one is for beta 2, which remember is our indicator variable that's saying whether that category is this one or that one. Usually there's two categories or maybe there's more. But this is our in, usually our indicator variable. Or in some kind, some cases, not this year, 
um, you might see this be some other variable that we're using to predict. But it's always an equal zero and a not equal zero select. That's so easy, you don't even have to think about it. You just have to list all the parameters and equal zero, equal zero, equal zero. We're going to do separate tests for each of these, but the computer does it all at once. So you do a set of hypotheses for each parameter that's in your model. And the ones that we've been working with in 14.1a just have these three. In 14.1c, we'll see what happens if there's one more, but then we're not going to go further than that this year. And of course, you would want to define your parameters and say what they are also context. Don't forget the context. Plan. You already know how to do this, because I did it up above. The plan is whether you're doing an F test or individual T test, the name of it, and then See above conditions and what you did before. And what's nice is you can check the conditions once for all of these tests put together. You don't have to check them over and over again. You just check them once. Probably I'll make that be Part A of the problem is check the conditions, and then part B is write the hypothesis. You know, I might do it in a different order just to say, you're just going to check this once. All right, the do, I will spend a little bit of time talking about how they do these calculations because it actually will kind of remind you of some other stuff. I'm going to start with the easier calculations, which is over here, and that is there is a t test for each of these separately. Each b gets subtracted subtract zero from the B, right? And then over FEB, we've seen this formula before, except this B is going to get replaced by B0 or B1 or B2 or whatever one you're working on at the time. And the good news, like I said, is you don't actually have to do this. The computer does it for you. So the computer is going to tell you the T for each of these parameters in, in the table, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, P value. HTTPF, except it's always times T, because we're doing two-sided tests here. And so it's still T and 999 and DF, and I have to tell you that DF is weird in this chapter. It is N minus K minus 1, but guess what? You don't have to do it, because the computer output will do all of this for you. So I'm giving you the formulas just because it feels more complete that way, but you don't actually have to do them. Right. F. For the overall F test, we're going to calculate F. And you might remember that with ANOVA, it was MSG over MSE, which is the mean squares for groups over, you know, it's almost the same here. It's the mean square for the model instead of for the group over the mean square error, it is still the good variation over the bad variation, just like for ANOVA, which makes me so happy. And I'm giving you this just because it feels right to tell you that there's a DF1 that's being an SS divided by a DF, and then another SS divided by a DF. But again, I, I almost didn't put all these formulas in the notes because you kind of just read it off the computer output, honestly. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what they are just because I know what they are, and they're kind of close to what we did with ANOVA. So SSM is calculated by adding a sum of a bunch of squares. That shouldn't surprise you. That's what SS stands for. It stands for sum of squares. And S for the model, this is the Y hats, which is our predicted values, minus the overall mean of Y. So in other words, how much is our predicted value different from our mean Y value? That's the um, variation explained by the model. Good variation. The bad variation, SSE, is the residuals. It's the sum of the squares of all the y minus y hats, which is the residuals. So it kind of makes sense to me, and that's why I'm telling you these formulas. DF1, AK, which is the number of x's or number of explanatory variables you have. So on the type that we were talking about in 14.1a, we would have x1 and x2, and so k would be 2. 
and then if k hap if we happen to have more variables, then you're going to have more, right? Uh, Zf2 is the same as over here. It's n minus k minus 1. So total of sample size minus how many x's you have minus 1. And it's complicated and you don't have to worry about it. And then you would find c with fcbf if you were doing it that way. But the calculator or the computer is going to give you all that. f and 999 and zf1 and zf2 and that's just like ANOVA and that makes me happy. So the computer is going to give you, believe it or not, the F and the P. You don't actually need these formulas, except I find them interesting. And that is why they are there. In fact, you're going to find all of this information in the computer output without any trouble. I just know it. So I'm not sure. Now well, I might show it to you right now. But anyway, now wait a second. So first we're going to talk about the conclusion. There is a justification for each separate p-value. You would have a justification and a decision and a context for each p-value. And so that's a lot of writing, which we're going to kind of shortcut today, and we're going to do a really good job of it in the warm-up on Wednesday. But I will talk about, if you're doing the overall F-test, so I'm continuing my two columns here, rejecting means that this whole model is not useful. Or, and I take it back, is useful. Rejecting is good. Rejecting the null means you conclude that this model is helpful in predicting this. Conclude uh, the model is useful. In other words, predicting with this model is better than just using the y-intercept to predict. Um, if you reject on the individual t-test, each time you reject, it means that particular coefficient is useful. This coefficient you're rejecting for is useful. And um, I think I'm going to actually, you know what? I'm going to have a little gap in my video. Well, I am going to get Because I want to show you one thing. So I'm talking while I'm walking across the room to get the thing I forgot to bring. Sorry about that. So, quick little example that you don't have to write down. And that is uh, what does that computer output look like? Here's the computer output. I'm going to zoom in on it for the jury trial. It's in your PDF on page 11 or so. And here's the three numbers that I just told you about in the last lesson where it was the um, 3, B0, B1, B2. Here's the T's and P's for the individual t-test. Notice they're all zero, which means all three of those are useful in the predictions. Reject three times. And then down here is kind of an, it actually it even says analysis of variance on it. This is the ANOVA table, which is for the overall F-test. And there's where you find the SS's and the MS's. I mean, I could give you a partial table and make you fill it in, right? Um, and then F and C. And that C is also zero. So all of these are zero, which is why I'm not going to write this down. But I wanted to say that that's where you look. You look in the um, regression table to get the individual T-test. And then you look in the ANOVA table to get the overall p value for the overall f test. And that's how easy it is to do that calculation. It's like just right there, right there for you, and you don't have to worry about it, which is kind of nice. All right, that's enough notes. I made you do a lot of notes today. Um, and we'll do some more on Wednesday.